to Christ the Center, your weekly conversation of Reformed theology. My name is Camden Busey. We're now on episode number 656. I'm here in Grays Lake, Illinois, and I'm delighted to be back with everybody, and particularly with our good friends. We have first, I'll introduce uh, Dr. Lane Tipton, who serves as a fellow of Biblical and Systematic Theology here, as well as, and more significantly, a pastor of Trinity OPC in Easton, Pennsylvania. Welcome back, Lane. It's good to see you. Oh, as always, it's great to be here, Camden. And we also have uh, with us uh, Jeff Waddington, who's pastor of Faith OPC in Fawn Grove, Pennsylvania. Welcome back, Jeff. It's good to see you, too. Oh, it's good to be here, brother. Yeah. Wonderful. Well, we've got a big uh, episode lined up. Uh, you know, sometimes as a podcast host, you kind of you, you think like you're going to be able to uh, to surprise people, but by the time they're listening or watching to this, they've already seen the title and description of what we're talking about. So there's really no way to uh, to su- surprise people unless they're just listening blindly on, a, on an automatic playlist of some sort. But today we're going to be talking about the theology and apologetics of Cornelius Van Til, one of our uh, favorite theologians. Uh, someone we are uh, greatly in debt to here at Reformed Forum and very thankful for his work in um, in Reformed apologetics specifically, but his particular approach to apologetics is merely an application of uh, confessional Reformed theology to that particular discipline, and, and therefore his, his approach to theology could be used in a variety of different uh, departments, and it has been. Uh, but we've got big news, and um, this whole episode is going to uh, focus on on w- walking through material uh, that Lane recently addressed in a new course that we have online at Reformed Academy. Now, I've been mentioning it in uh, episodes past, uh, but if you head on over to reformedforum.org, you'll notice that there is a, uh, a new tab at the top of the page where you can click Academy, and there you can browse uh, courses You can uh, follow along and you can check in on your progress for how you're doing in those courses and uh, pick up where you left off. And uh, with this course, an introduction to the theology and apologetics of Cornelius Van Til, we now have four courses uh, available. We have my course, Introduction to Covenant Theology, Jim's course, Introduction to the Westminster uh, Shorter Catechism, Questions 1 through 38, and then Lane's course, Foundations of Covenant Theology, which is uh, the seminar that he taught in Wimberley, Texas, last year. So we're trying to build out the curriculum and uh, really excited about the way it's coming along. And with this intro course, uh, we have eight uh, major sections totaling over five hours of instruction. I think when I broke it all down by individual video segments, we have, I believe, 43 videos uh, ranging from, you know, five minutes to 12 minutes on average in that ballpark. And uh, it's just a, a wonderful, wonderful series. We're going to talk about that today, walk through the different uh, sections and aspects of the theology. Uh, but before we do that, I also want to mention that this is just the beginning of courses on Van Til and, of course, on, on everything that we want to, uh, to produce and distribute through Reformed Academy. Our faculty has about a list of 40 classes that, we're, that we've sketched out and uh, working on preparing and scheduling and uh, filming uh, here in the studio and then putting out uh, online for free as, as, uh, as much as possible. And, uh, of course, this Van Til course is free, but it's only the first of a scheduled eight courses. So what you'll find is that the in, in the lectures, lecture one is kind of an overall introduction to everything, but then lectures, main sections two through eight, which, again, are about four-plus hours of material, are serve as introductions to what we hope will eventually become an entire course in its own right. So we'll break that down and uh, talk about it today, and I'm excited to do so. But first, I got to mention at least a reminder of where we uh, where we met. Now, Jeff, you and I met uh, online kind of uh, th- through some odd circuitous means, uh, through an old website called solagratia.org that I was running uh, with a friend of mine, and then you started writing for it. And then uh, we became uh, friends, kind of, you're my, I always joke, you're my first uh, internet friend. And then I remember back in, uh, after we'd been talking for a couple years on and off on the phone and through email, I came out to to Westminster in Philadelphia to uh, find an apartment because I was planning to matriculate in person uh, in the summer of uh, 2007. So Jeff, do you remember that? Do you remember coming to to pick me up in your van at the uh, Montgomery Library after hours? 
I do remember that, and then we're taking you over to to Lane's front porch, right? It, it's a, yep, exactly where <laughs> Lane still lives uh, today, and uh, yep. yeah, you're, you're like we're gonna go over for this uh, for this meeting. Do you remember what it was a meeting of? This is an oh, interrogation of Jeff and Dawson Case, right? Yes, the Dawson Case Society. Can you you were involved with that much you know earlier than I was because this was my first introduction to it. What can you explain that? Because it's uh, yeah, it was a subject. student uh, formed and led. A discussion group, DOS being the nickname for Machen because uh, Machen is the uh, German word for a girl or maiden, right? Mm -hmm. And the DOS would would simply be the the definite article. Uh, and then K's is the nickname for uh, Doctor Van Til. Uh, I guess K's is a is a nickname for Cornelius. Yeah, it's uh, like a common nickname. So like that, we had Bill that's for it's William. the nicknames for Machen and Van Til, and so it was an apologetics, a Westminster and apologetics orientation, student formed and led discussion group, and the the, the, the so the students who attended, uh, there was one gentleman who who led the group who was, I guess, basically behind it, and I forget his name now. I can, I can see him in my mind. Well, there have been eye. several over the years. Yes. Um, so it was, changed. Uh, Matt you Williams know, it, was running it for a while, and Nate Shannon uh, was running it for a little while. And, uh, I think it was Matt who I remember. He had red right. hair and beard. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yeah. Okay. So it was a good, it was a good discussion group, uh, sometimes more uh, vigorous than uh, at other times. And so that's what, we, that's what I took you to on, on Lane's front porch. And as you know, we've had many such uh, front porch uh, visits over the years with um, right. uh, with Lane. Yeah, I was just an enterprising, you know, young student. had I had taken some distance courses, but I hadn't done anything on campus yet. I hadn't taken uh, much in by way of any introduction to to Machen or Van Til, but I've been reading Van Til quite a bit on my own, and so I was just ecstatic that we were going to go talk about Van Til and uh, delighted to you know, to be able to interact with people face to face <laughs> on this subject matter. Yeah. Cause it's not something you can find people to talk about with very often. And so, uh, that, that was kind of the beginning of it, uh, where I met you in person was the same day. And then you took me uh, right away to go meet Lane on his porch. And, and we, we have had many, many conversations on that porch since then. And, uh, really just tried to continue on that, that tradition of, um, of theological and philosophical interaction. Uh, ideally in service of the church. And so that's what we're trying to continue here with this new curriculum and, and specifically with this first course, this introduction to the theology and apologetics of Cornelius Van Til. Uh, Lane, why don't you explain, you do it in the class, but uh, let us know a little bit about this class and, and about your introduction to Van Til. I think that'll serve us well as we start to get into the material. Yeah, it's a labor of love for me to do it. Um, I, when I was converted back in 1987, um, one of the first things I did was call David Brack, uh, who was doing Young Life in Amarillo at the time. And I would attend Young Life meetings off and on when I was in high school, but I had absolutely no interest in Christ. It was a purely social thing. Uh, but I always listened to him, and he always had a lot of really good things to say. So I called him as soon as I was converted. And after he had given me Sproul and Packer and Burkoff and a few other theologians, I kept asking for more. I told him how much I appreciated, gave me Warfield. Um, he wound up giving me uh, both Voss and Van Til, but uh, in order, it was Van Til first and then Voss. And um, I began to read Van Til. And early on, I would say that in the movement of my conviction set, I became convinced very, very quickly of Calvinism and covenant theology. Pedo-baptism flows right out of that. And then I started to understand the depth of Van Til's penetration on topics of Trinity and covenant, his transcendental or presuppositional apologetical approach. And, um, and, and during that time also became aware of the work of Greg Bonson and began studying under Bonson at the time, as soon as I heard that he was offering courses and was an expositor of Van Til. This was all uh, well before I went to Westminster, California in 1994 and studied out there under Klein and Strimple. Frame was there and others clowning. And so, um, you know, v Van Til has been someone that as early as late 87, I'd say early 88, uh, I 
through Mr. Lee at Westminster Discount Book Service. <laughs> um, I bought all of the things that he had after I read uh, what Brat gave me, which was Christian apologetics and defense of the faith. I, I combed all of the places I could find to get the resources from Van Til. And through Mr. Lee uh, at Westminster Discount Book Service, I published the Intro to Systematic Theology, the Survey of Christian Epistemology, uh, Common Grace in the Gospel. And so this this has been almost coming of a, of a full circle to come back and finally do a a course that introduces his theology and apologetics and tries tries to capture something of the grand scope and depth of his theological and apologetical enterprise. So this right. this course was a particular delight for me. It really was. Oh, I I wish I had this when I when I was started. Yes. Uh, when I think back to when I got into it, I, I got into Van Til to begin with uh, through a, a recommendation. Of, there was a friend of mine, a, an associate pastor at the church I was attending, who was a, a, a student, a PhD student at TED's. So he'd drive three hours. This was in Peoria, Illinois. So he'd drive three hours to get up to Deerfield, Illinois, to go to Trinity Evangelical Divinity School. And he wanted to, uh, he had received some Van Til instruction at the Master Seminary. Because uh, they had an apologetics professor there who was influenced by Van Til. Van Til, mm. excuse me. And so um, he wanted to kind of bone up on it uh, in preparation of his of his PhD studies. So he said, "Hey, Camden, why don't we read this book together?" Because I I would meet with him every week, uh, just as kind of a young man, you know, he was kind of discipling me. Uh, but I I could tell he kind of wanted to redeem his time, you know. So he's discipling me, but he's also getting something done to benefit him. <laughs> Which is fine. It's great if you can double up that way, and I was all for it. He said, let's read uh, this book, and he sent me a link to Van Til's Apologetic by Greg Bonson, which is, oh, yeah. for you know, sadly out of print. Now we find oh, out. Oh, that's hope, we hope, we, Yes. <laughs> we hope uh, some folks from PNR Publishing are listening because we would like to sell a lot more copies of that uh, with students that sign up for this free online course. And... Um, and uh, you know, so if they could print another round of those, I think uh, I think we could do some work to traffic them. Um, yes. Anyway, so that's that's a you know I read that book, which is a combination of of selections of Van Til's work from many of his different books. So it, it collates them all and topically, and then Bonson would include his own commentary, introduction, and interaction with the material. So it's it's quite useful, and uh, that was published in '98. I have no idea what life would have been like in '87. Uh, incidentally, in God's providence, that's the year Van Til died, the year that you were converted to the Lord. So um, you came to Van Til right after, uh, no doubt, he passed away. We weren't and able I to asked meet him. Brack, what, "May I please meet this man?" Yeah. And he told me, he said, "Lane, you're not going to believe this." But the summer that 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 you were converted, Van Til had just passed away, and mm-hmm. I was. I was so sad. I yeah. really wanted to talk to him. Someday. Yeah. yeah. That, that Someday is, you will. That is, yeah. uh, I wish I could meet him too. But, uh, you know, I was seven. You know, I was concerned with uh, <laughs> not even baseball yet. So anyway, yeah. long time ago. So there there weren't a lot of introductory materials when I started to get in more deeply. Uh, you know, you read Van Til directly. You know, I'd try to read all of the secondary literature that I possibly could on it, stuff that's got Oliphant Road, so stuff uh, I think of um, uh, Tom Nataro's Van Til and the Use of Evidence. I, I've relayed my story about that. I read I read that book in Wrigley Field during a rain delay. Um, <laughs> and the instant I finished it, they said, play ball. It was, it was glorious. And then... Um, <laughs> Oh, uh, Bonson had, you know, the great debate with Gordon Stein. I've listened to that. I found that online. And then also uh, a series, like an introductory series where he taught, he gave like four or five lectures to college students. I don't even know where that was. Do you know what that is, guys? Uh, it was a video, a DVD series I think I got from American Vision uh, <laughs> or, or their Covenant Media Foundation, one of those thereabouts, and uh, and watched his his lecture series in which he was walking through uh, several basics of uh, reformed apologetics in the tradition of Van Til. So, but other than that, there really isn't any comprehensive um, course uh, that would deal specifically with Cornelius Van Til until unless you went to Westminster Theological Seminary. Uh, but even right. even there, there sometimes the emphases are of a you know because it's a seminary course it's not necessarily going to provide the same kind of introduction or even necessarily emphasize the same kinds of things 
uh, that that this course does. And so this course, I believe, it's while it's while it's um, substantial, and uh, certainly every single Vantillian uh, would be, and you know, just Reformed theologian, no matter if you're a PhD or you're just new to it, they certainly benefit from it. We've been sending it to a lot of folks, uh, Bill Dennison, Danny Olinger, Alan Strange, you name it. There, there are many people that are just delighted to have these resources. And these people know Van Til very, very well, uh, yet are benefiting greatly. Nevertheless, we're starting from the building blocks, but going very deep and thorough. And Lane, I think you just really nailed it with this class and providing an introduction like this. There's just, there really is nothing out there quite like it. It's unparalleled in that sense. Now, before, Lane, before you respond, that lecture series presented to students, Camden, that uh, Greg Bonson did, sounds like it might be the basis of this new book, which is Against All Opposition, yeah. which is kind yeah. of a um, very basic. It's not, it doesn't go into a lot of detail. Uh but it's a good intro. I mean, a good first book. But anyway, so that's interesting because it goes, dates back to the mid 80s, the original talks. Anyways, there you go. I think he was referencing Terminator 2 and the one I watched. So that would have been early 90s. But uh, okay. <laughs> I'm sure he had done many and had been invited to various. It might have even been at UC Irvine or through a campus ministry oh, or okay. something like that. Yeah, he but, did that frequently. I so bet. it's. But anyway, that's based on a series he did in the mid '80s. Yeah, just right. a side note on the Van Til's apologetic, which I pray comes back into print. It's an invaluable resource. Um, when it came out, I was thrilled because mm. when I read it, it was a survey of everything I'd learned from Bonson in the advanced apologetics courses I'd taken with him, and the only main difference was that he had uh, put into those lectures large swatches of primary sources from Van Til's corpus. And then the coursework that he had done explicating Van Til was kind of interspersed with it. And so uh, it was a, a wonderful review of really what Bonson gave you, ranging from the intro to a few advanced courses on apologetics. And I've just got to say, I found them so useful. There's there's so much more to say, and we do that in this course. We advance beyond what Bonson had said, but just such a wonderful foundational resource. I hope it comes back into print. Yeah, yeah. Now yeah, that, that would be delightful, as I understand having conversation with folks at at PNR. Their stock has sold off, and they don't even. It's because it predates the PDF step in the in the printing process, so they don't even have a PDF. Uh, of the of the yeah, book. there's some technical hmm. challenges, but um, well, you know, if they we'll, we'll try to work on it, get them to do it. If they yeah. won't do it, try to maybe they can give it to us. <laughs> we'll get there, some there volunteers to uh, to work on that. We can get it typeset and printed it up, print it up again. Who knows? Uh, it needs to exist. Now, uh, there are a lot of uh, Van Til's writings that are somewhat difficult to come by. We've got a special kind of episode of Reform Media Review where we review a lot of uh, these original copies with Ryan Noah. So I hope to produce that, get that edited, and get it on the website sooner rather than later. But for prospective students who want to take the course and maybe are having difficulty finding the books, you can find them on the used market. But you can also get the works of Van Til through Lagos. So years ago, I think it was Eric Sigward, who I do yeah. not know, who put together kind of a Van Til digital library on a CD-ROM you know, for you young mm -hmm. ones. Uh, you know, used to get software and resources on <laughs> CDs, <laughs> compact discs, which you still may see around today. But uh, um, before that, oh, we had, old -timers we do had that, right? three and a half floppies, five and a quarter floppies before that. Um I'm, I still I'm expressing have the CD wrong. <laughs> <You did>. Yeah. <laughs> Probably won't even load in your computer. But uh, uh, point being, you can get the digital resources through Logos, the, the entire Van Til collection right there, which is which is uh, tremendously handy. So things are a little bit more accessible if you have some some money. Um, and they're not. It's not too cost prohibitive to get that library. But if you don't have it, um, you know, finding used books. But the the Van the Van Til Reader by Botson is is a real quick, easy way for thirty bucks or so to just get a large swath of what you need. Yes, but yeah, let's talk a bit about um, some of the materials and the in the in the course, and particularly the necessity of this class. 
to some people may say, well, why, why spend so much time on Cornelius Van Til? Are you guys, you know, exalting this man to be, you know, some sort of saint? Is this some, um, you know, form of hagiography? Uh, the, the, why, why does Reformed Forum care so much about Voss and Van Til? It's weird. It's uh, quirky. Uh, well, <laughs> sure, it can be weird and quirky, but that doesn't bother me. I hope it doesn't bother you too, brothers. No, uh, but no, not we, at all. We love these uh, two theologians so much because they are they are excellent expressions of a of a type of theologizing of a of an approach to the scripture that we believe is most faithful uh, to what the Bible tells us exactly. about itself. And so, yeah. when we're looking at how God has revealed Himself through the things that have been made. And also through his word specifically, we also realize how he revealed himself progressively through the ages and how he interacts with his people, uh, mediated through covenants to bring his chosen people into uh, a, a more glorious, exalted life with him in heavenly places. And Voss and Van Til are more contemporary ish. Uh, examples of theologians who understood that and uh, devoted their life to expressing that very idea. So when we're following after and, and trying to build upon the work of Voss and Van Til, it's not out of blind devotion to these men. Uh, we hope it's not, and we don't ever want it to be, but it's out of uh, following in their model, in their mold, uh, in their path, and, uh, and really learning from and, and seeking their leadership, so to speak, through, through their writings and through their example. And so Voss Group is, is a, a means by which we promote that legacy. And Van Til, uh, an excellent student of Voss, Voss was his uh, most influential teacher, is certainly is, is an excellent model of how a Vossian type of theology and biblical theology may be applied to the discipline of apologetics or defending the faith. But really, we see with Van Til that he's not merely a, a, a narrow-minded apologist. Uh, but a, a theologian seeking to express um, the very nature of the immutable, self-contained trinity and how that triune God relates to all of creation and is, in fact, the foundation of and the sustainer of all of that creation. But, brothers, why it's Van Til's under attack? Uh, he always has been, ever since he started writing. But in many ways, we see a resurgence of this attack, either from... Uh, people outside the tradition entirely, especially with people that would criticize Van Til's uh, reading of uh, Thomas Aquinas. But we see it even from within our own uh, denominations, you know, the circles of Day Park. Uh, we have uh, folks like um, Richard Muller. We have John Fesco, Keith Matheson, other people that are attacking Van Til and, and trying to demonstrate how he is an incompetent theologian others who reject his uh, approach to natural theology. Um, whether they understand it is another question. There's a forthcoming book from the Davenant Institute I was just made aware of that's going to be addressing, I think, with 13 different chapters, all of Van Til's failures in natural theology. So, you know, we're dealing with mm. a context, uh, a polemical context, in which uh, Van Til's kind of being uh, dug up from the grave and, and uh, trying to kick him. You know, uh, but at the same time, we, we see that his theology and what he actually taught is still as applicable, as important, and as necessary uh, today as it was back in the 50s and 60s. Uh, Van Til was yep. largely writing in a polemical context against uh, absolute idealists and against uh, neo orthodoxy, but the errors of those theologies are, are just you know, uh, multiplying today. They're, they maybe are multiplying in different forms, but brothers, I, I mean, do you agree? I mean, I'm I'm seeing evangelical appropriations of all the things that, that Van Til was trying to fight against. Well, certainly uh, you have uh, some of the negative assessment of Van Til is, is, is attributed to misunderstanding. Some of it is, uh, I suppose, uh, bad will. Some of it is uh, the result of of uh, students of Van Til who have not uh, followed in his track uh, as they ought to. Uh, but certainly, you know, Van Til has been iconoclastic in, in terms of the history of apologetics. He's also he's applying uh, standard 
what I'd call standard Dutch Dutch reform, continental reform, also Westminsterian reform theology to the discipline of, of apologetics. And uh, one of the benefits of, say, having Bovink in English now is that you read him and you go, wow, he sounds like Van Til. Well, what we, re- what we realize is actually Van Til is sounding Bovinkian. Uh, or Voss and uh, Voss's dogmatic. Voss, yeah, mm-hmm. I mean the same thing, right? You so you realize that 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 Van Til is 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 synthesizing. He's bringing he's or he's weaving a tapestry from strands that are, that that have been uh, understood and appreciated within the reform uh, tradition, and he's taking it and applying it to an area that and showing demonstrating that that apologetics has often been done. Uh, in a hodgepodge, um, a cl- over too eclectic a manner, not consistent with the theology it's seeking to oh, yeah. defend. Apologetics no. is it, often it, approached as some sort of arbitrary decision that you make after your theology is done. You know, you have right. a you have a method of you, you you say, well, we've said all these things about theology, but then the reform person who believes that God is the creator and sustainer of all things, God is omniscient, omnipotent. And but yet at the same time, uh, we're all of a sudden going to decide that practically speaking, man just operates on his own, <laughs> and we're going to, uh, right. you know, give evidences, uh, new, neutral facts to to unbelievers who are dead in their sins and uh, incapable of thinking correctly uh, about about matters, and we're going to allow them to ascertain the truthfulness of Scripture uh, based on these evidences we give them. Now, I know it's very simplistic and, and uh, simplified, but um, those are some of the matters that are at stake. But it all starts for Van Til with the very doctrine of God, which is why I love the fact that Voss's Reformed Dogmatics are available, but also Bovink, and there's been such a resurgence in Bovink studies. We see the Trinitarian approach and the, the, the commitment to classical theism, you know, the classical forms of, of uh, immutability and the divine attributes. We see Voss and Bovink having a commitment to those, but Van Til as well. Now, Van Til did speak uh, in, in, at times in an innovative way in order to protect what I believe is a classical form of theism. But, Lane, could you explain how, how the Trinity and the self-contained triune God is so essential to Van Til? If we get that wrong, you can't understand anything he's talking about. Sure. Let, let me put it, uh, let me build on the previous conversation as well, incorporate that in. I think what a lot of Van Til's critics are concerned about is some of Van Til's disciples have gone the way of theological mutualism, ascribe change to God, uh, claim that when God relates to the world, he needs intermediate, neither divine nor human properties that relate him to the world. And that uh, it makes it appear that Van Til himself might be heterodox. But if you look back at what Van Til's doing, following Voss and um, the Reformed tradition, Van Til, one of his chief critiques of Bard is Bard is not Chalcedonian. Bard is not fundamentally full-blooded creedal. He, he has rejected the theology of the ecumenical creeds and intermingled God and man. Um, and that, and Van Til's uh, critique of many other theologians and philosophers is that they're not fully reformed. They're not Calvinistic. They're not following the confessional standards uh, of the church. And so Van Til's starting point as someone committed to the theology of the scriptures is that he is deeply creedal, robustly confessional, and he's not an evangelical biblicist trying to do his theology in the corner, aiming for innovation. He's taking the resources of the scriptures and their creedal and confessional expressions, and he's seeking to apply them in an orthodox way in constructive context. He's, he's interacting with idealism. He's interacting with Bard. He's interacting with Roman Catholicism. Uh, and, and he's fundamentally orthodox, yet deeply constructive as a theologian. Now, um, a, a lot of his critics, I think, uh, for reasons due to biblicistic and evangelical uh, misappropriations of Van Til, by, by, even by those who might uh, want to claim the name Van Tilian, I think that's put a really bad taste in the mouths of some of his critics. But if you go back to his doctrine of the Trinity, for instance, which you, you asked about, Camden, one of the things that Van Til makes so explicit um, is that If you deny that God remains self-contained 
immutable and impassable in his relation to creation. If you deny that point, Ventil says you have committed perhaps the chief theological sin of correlativism. That is, making God and the creature mutually participant uh, uh, in a common event of becoming, uh, a common uh, vortex of change and transitions and intellectual and emotional growth that applies to God and man in this new relation of mutual becoming, participation in time and change and chance. Van Til, uh, seeking to be Chalcedonian, will not allow for any kind of mutual participation either of the creature in God or God in the creature. And in that way, and this is exemplified especially in his critique of Bart, in that way, Van Til is stunningly Chalcedonian, and he's thoroughgoing in his theology of God as simple, absolute, and immutable, not simply apart from, but even more intensively in his relation to creation and in his special act of providential voluntary condescension, which we call covenant. So that the God of the covenant is an absolute, immutable, impassable, self-contained God in the final reference point of all human predication, and the one who in his revelation, therefore, speaks with absolute authority. I think if, if critics of Van Til would recognize the depth of that insight, the deeply Catholic and Reformed character of his Reformed biblical and systematic theology, I think they would go from being critics to being deeply appreciative of someone who not only held the line of orthodoxy, but constructively advanced it over against the inroads of deviant Roman Catholic theology, deviant neo-orthodox theology, deviant absolute idealism, and other forms of idealism. And uh, this course is designed in part to capture that Van Til who has been forgotten due to uh, a, a constellation of reasons, I think. Yeah. Well, let's parse this out a little to speak about two very basic examples. You mentioned theological mutualism, but then you also mentioned, you know, evangelical approaches. We could fit in there, modernist approaches, because that's where some of the evangelical approaches are moving. And Van Til was uh, one of the earliest English writing critics on on uh, Bart and uh, the form of new, modern, new modernism, but then the Roman Catholic side of things. So when we're talking about the God-world relationship, Van Til uh, purportedly would come in every single lecture, and he would draw the same lesson, uh, the same diagram on the chalkboard. It's two circles, a larger circle and then a smaller circle. Those are connected by lines. And the larger circle was supposed to represent the self-contained triune God, the absolute God, independent, immutable, impassable, everything that we want to say according to classical theism, and particularly reformed confessional theism. He did not want right. to, nor did he, deviate from that. And we can Amen. talk about his Trinitarian theology when, when we get there, and you can also watch the lectures on that uh, if you want, would like to criticize. But the point is that there's the creator, there's the creature, and we can't blend the two. The lines that represent uh, the connection are meant to indicate the voluntary condescension on God's part, which we express by way of covenant. That's how God has told us he relates to us. But in that relation, there is never a blending or a merging of the two. And that's where so many approaches go wrong because they introduce a third thing. Lane, can you explain what that third thing is? for, well, maybe start with Bart first, and then we see how that works itself out in evangelical theology of late, where people are a little bit fascinated with some of those things, but then also the Roman Catholic version. Yeah, um, with a, when you're thinking about the creator-creature distinction, Bart affirms the absolute ontological distinction between the creator and the creature. But where Bart goes so wrong is when God relates to the creature he relates by virtue of a third thing that he calls God's time for us. God takes time to himself in the event of Jesus Christ so that both God and man in Jesus Christ are in a mutual process of becoming God for us. 
and God with us. There's a mutualizing of divine and human participation in time so that God is not in relation to the creature, absolute, self-contained, simple, impassable. He is rather a participant in the becoming that we ascribe to the creature, mutually appropriated to God in this event of God's becoming Jesus Christ, the Christ event. And um, both Van Til and Bovink say that there is no intermediate category between the creator and the creature in which the two participate and by which they are related. Not time, if it's Bart, uh, not being, if it's Roman Catholic theology, not historical contingency, if it's evangelical mutualism. Rather, God as the self-contained triune God relates to man as dependent and created and contingent, and he does not need any third thing in order to relate. He relates sovereignly, freely from himself, so that God as God, self-contained and absolute, relates to man as man, image-bearer in covenant, without either man participating in God's being or God participating in man's becoming. And that is, if, if you want something rock bottom for the theology of Van Til, you have to say this, what he affirms in the creator-creature distinction, he continues to affirm at every point in the creator-creature relation, and that sets him off over against neo-orthodoxy on the one side, Roman Catholicism on the, on the other side, because in, in neo-orthodoxy, God and man participate in this third time, and in Roman Catholicism, man, through grace, begins to participate in the interior essence and processions of the Godhead, and Van Til is saying, a robust no to both. And in that way, he's maintaining something not only true of classical theism, but he's maintaining something fundamentally true of reformed anthropology and covenant. And, um, and, and I think if, as, as we continue to expound Van Til and understand him against the backdrop of his robust commitment to Augustine, Calvin, Voss, Bavink, the Hodges, and others, I think you start to get a very different view of Van Til than Van Til, some kind of, let, let's just say, some kind of evangelical, biblicistic mutualist. He's actually the very antithesis of those things. And the course is designed in part to help people get uh, an orientation of Van Til to see some of these things. Yeah. Idealism is another one that gets thrown in there. I guess that's yeah. the last lecture here in the in the course, last section. So we have eight major sections. The eighth major section is on idealism, uh, although the there are forty three, I believe, uh, uh, video segments here. But idealism is one that's thrown out there so often because Van Til will use terms like concrete, universal, and other phrases that were typically used by. Uh, idealists, either absolute idealists or, uh, you know, of the British variety, but there are also Americans, uh, there's also Germans, we've got Hegel, we've got Kant, you name it. Uh, Van Til was thoroughly uh, aware of various forms of idealism and sought to criticize them and, and really to destroy uh, that theology as it posed a danger to the church even in his uh, doctoral dissertation, and he never stopped doing it throughout all of his works. But nevertheless, at least as early as the 1950s, in 1953, with the Calvin um, uh, Forum, there were several articles by Jesse DeBoer, Cliff Orlebeck, uh, and others who were claiming that Van Til was an idealist. Look at the terms he uses. He's just, he's an idealist. And now we're seeing a resurrection of this with the criticisms from Fesco and and others uh, who are presently, um, you know, resurrecting a criticism from 70 years ago. So how did Van Til relate to idealism? What was his intent? And uh, not just his intent, but what do, what do his writings demonstrate about his awareness of idealism and his fundamental critique of it? Uh, that, that's something we deal with in, in the course, both in the intro and the first lecture and then in the final lecture. And let me just put it this way, the hallmark of 
uh, idealism, the absolute idealism that Van Til was interacting with, is that the absolute needs the particulars of the changing space-time world to achieve full self-consciousness, to come to full actualization. Uh, put it this way, Bart actualizes the mutuality of God and man at the alpha point in the Christ event. That's where God and time, uh, God and man come together in this third time and both are mutually becoming in the Christ event. For the absolute idealist, there is an incremental movement by which the absolute comes toward full self-actualization, comes toward full self-consciousness of both self and the world through a process of interaction with space-time particular particularity, moving toward what Hegel called a concrete universal, where there's nothing in the universal not expressed in the particulars, there's nothing in the particulars not contained in the universal. And, and the point of absolute idealism is that the absolute becomes absolute only at the omega point of an historical process. Van Til pays Bart and paste the idealist, but now we're talking about idealism. Van Til says, no, 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 no. If you're looking for a concrete universal, a fully self-conscious, self-contained, self-complete entity, do not think of an historical process moving toward an omega point and yielding a concrete universal. Rather, think of God himself as self-contained, self-complete, immutable, impassable, and simple in all all of his relation to creation, from its alpha to its omega, that God remains self-contained at every point along the line. There is no becoming. There is no development. There is no unactualized potential in God. And so Van Til's critique of absolute idealism, we could talk about Kant if we decide to, um, is that it reduces to pragmatism, to the idea that space and time and change and chance are fundamental to the identity of the developing absolute. And so uh, Van Til's brilliant critique of idealism, and by the way, if, if you don't understand his doctoral dissertation and his critique of idealism, you're going to miss the rest of his theology and his critique of, of post-enlightenment theology and philosophy in particular. His critique is that that absolute idealism is no better than pragmatism. Why? Because it cannot affirm at any point the self-contained, self-complete triune personal God. And so in this in this lecture series, we, we try to feature that and say that when Van Til uses the language of the concrete universal, it's analogous to John using the Logos theology, uh, using the Logos language in John 1 and saying the Logos is not an eminent principle of rationality, but the self-contained um, person of the Trinity that uh, second person of the Trinity, eternally begotten of the Father, and um, as such, immutable, impassable, and self-contained. Um, so, so Van Til's language of, of concrete universal, far from being a concession to idealism, is the strongest conceivable critique of idealism, because he's saying that what the idealists are after, a concrete universal, cannot be found through a historical process oh, that yeah. yields a concrete universal. You have to begin with the one uh, in, in whom unity and diversity are equally ultimate and equally immutable from all eternity. Yeah, and there's a great difference with the Kantian form as well, because uh, the idealist would say in the Kantian variety that there are are merely phenomena out there, but it's it's the mind of the critical subject that imposes categories upon the phenomena in order to make sense of them. So, in effect, reality exists in the mind of each critical subject. And Van Til is saying the exact opposite of that, because he would say that reality exists in, in the mind and according to the knowledge of God and according to his sovereign power alone, and that all subjects, all human beings— think God's thoughts after him, yet on a created level, analogously. We don't have a strict identity with God, but that doesn't make our knowledge false either. 
Um, it, these are some just very basic categories, very basic theological constructs that Van Til uses, which are mere applications of just very basic uh, uh, dictums, dicta of classical theism. Yes. God is omniscient. We are not. God creates and sustains. We don't. We don't become God. God remains transcendent, yet he truly relates to us. Van Til's just working these basic points out in polemics and in defending the truth in the face of a variety of errors, uh, forms of idealism being one, and uh, you know uh, uh, the, the, there are many others uh, that he addresses, neo-orthodoxy, etc., one final thing, on, uh, just on concrete universal, sometimes people have difficulty thinking about terms like that. Think of the the uh, alternative term, an abstract universal. You know, there are many who would say that God doesn't exist. He's just a mere idea, something that we make up, you know, a God of the gaps of, of sorts or some some power that's out there that, you know, we, can, we, we can't make sense of the world, so we have to have some sort of universal explanation that kind of totalizes everything, a, a unified theory of everything, you know, in the form of a deity. And Van Til saying, no, a God is the universal, but he's also concrete. As there are those who would say that things that are real can only be particular. And he's saying, no, we have a concrete universal. So even there, he's doing, in some ways, a, a, a play on words, uh, uh, appropriating a term from idealism, but using that term to demonstrate, number one, the the failures of idealism on its own terms, but number two, the, the wonderful truth of, of uh, God's uh, scriptures as they've been given to us. Um, Amen. That's what Van Til's all about. Yeah. In, yep. in fact, in Common Grace in the Gospel, to make your, that same point, Camden, I think this is right on point, Van Til says that for a Christian philosophy of history, the moment in terms of its the interface of laws and facts and the lockstep transitions that uh, move in time, that the significance of the moment is exhausted by the being, plan, and knowledge of the immutable triune God. And so it is this God who gives the moment its significance and is in no way conditioned by the moment, but is the all-conditioning one who renders the moment what it is and right. gives it its significance. And that is the polar far side of what the idealists were saying about the nature of history in relation to the absolute. So it's a, it's an absolute, con here, pun is intended here, an absolute contrast that Van Til's drawing with the absolute idealist tradition. And the same with Kant. He's saying that God, not the human mind, is the source for all intelligibility, et, et cetera. Um, and it, it really it really is just Van Til's dependence on the scriptures as understood in the creeds and confessions of the church and really epitomized in the biblical and systematic theology of his favorite professor, Voss. Uh, take his reform dogmatics, take his biblical theology, take the Pauline eschatology, take the self-disclosure, take the kingdom of God in the church, take all that Voss taught Van Til um, as being a kind of expression of the deeper Protestant conception contained in the creeds and confessions of the church. It's that deeper Protestant conception that Van Til is so brilliantly and comprehensively applying to the issues of his day. And that really has to be given all of the emphasis that we can give it, I think. Uh, I, I would just say uh, that that uh, your your last section on idealism i think should put to bed any uh, accusations that van till is an idealist and i would say that uh with with the whole course in view that that uh, there is a clarity and a depth and a breadth that is i've not seen in other presentations uh, and we know that that this is a kind of a, this is a prospectus for a whole series of courses, right? You get this one and then out of this will de we'll develop uh, several other, ideally, pardon the pun, uh, uh, several other courses that will de go into more detail than you do even here. But I just want to say the clarity, depth, and breadth uh, of the presentation is one that I wish I had had when first introduced to uh, Dr. Van Til's oh. work, it would it it would have 
contributed greatly to the practical absorption of his material and use of his apologetic in, in my life. Yeah, I wish I had it myself. Uh, we got to say the course is available online right now. It is for free. Uh, this is uh, Friday. Uh, well, in the uh, podcast published time, this should be Friday, July uh, 24th, 2020. So if you head on over to reformedforum.org slash academy, uh, you should see a list of courses. And uh, this would be one of them, an introduction to the theology and apologetics of Cornelius Van Til. You can register for free if you don't already have an account. They're free accounts, and then you can register for the course and start taking it. So again, there, there are 43, I believe. I, I, I'm pretty sure that's the correct number. But at least uh, five hours and about 15 minutes of instruction on video. We did it in studio. We have three camera angles. We, we did our best. We're getting, we keep getting better and better, but uh, I think this turned out really nicely, better than our, our, our previous work, uh, which also turned out well. Um, but we um, have this broken down into eight segments, uh, and then each of the eight segments has a corresponding quiz. So as you watch the videos uh, and uh, do the reading uh, with the reading schedule that we've supplied, then you can uh, follow along and take the questions uh, that, that help to reinforce the main points of the lectures, the videos. And the, you can do self-assessment because the, the system, the platform will tell you, you know, the questions you got wrong. And then you can know if you should go back and review some material before moving on to the other material. And uh, you can progress through the course. And then hopefully we'll have the next one out by the time you finish. Uh, and if not, then, then head on over and take some of our other courses in the meantime until we get the next one produced and, and distributed. And finally, I do also want to mention and just whet the appetite that we are in the works of, of creating other forms, other learning opportunities. So um, we don't have it all uh, worked out in terms of the schedule and the, and the logistics of it as of yet. But I do want people to know that we are developing online study groups or what, we're, what we call cohorts where you will be able to, uh, to apply and uh, to, to become a member, a part of a cohort for uh, online study. And uh, as it looks right now, it'll probably be once a week for about an hour, uh, probably for eight weeks. And uh, you'll be able to, to be in a group with perhaps in the ballpark of about 10 students. Uh, as well as uh, Dr. Tipton leading the, the discussion. And uh, you'll come prepared by watching the lectures, by um, you know doing the quizzes and doing the readings, but then come for a weekly discussion group where you can work out the ideas in, in groups. Uh, we can, in, in many ways, try to reproduce uh, the Dawson K Society and the experience of uh, learning on the front porch, which I always found to be uh, the, the place where I integrated and applied where I really came to own, uh, you know, the material I was learning in the classroom. So this would be beneficial, not just for um, people new to Van Til, although we encourage people new to Van Til with the basic understanding of, uh, you know, of uh, Reformed theology that you, you can learn and participate and grow from this, but also uh, seminary students uh, who would like to uh, augment their education and, uh, and supplement it in, in ways with this uh, reach, uh, this rich and deep theology of Van Til. And even those who are, who are uh, ministers, pastors, and other academics who are already out there that have uh, been reading and interacting with Reformed apologetics for many, many years, you will grow and be richly blessed. I myself was, was uh, tremendously benefited by, um, by watching these lectures and, and working through the material. I know Jeff has as well and, and many other theologians. So this is something um, in which everyone, everyone can benefit. So we encourage you to head on over and, and sign up uh, no matter where you are. And we're working on raising some funds to try to get translations as well. As we speak, uh, we have uh, 37 countries represented at Reformed Academy, and uh, we are expecting that to grow. And we welcome people from all over the world to come and to participate and take our free courses. And we're trying our best to, uh, to raise the necessary funds so that we can get those videos um, closed captioned in English as well as uh, translated in a variety of language. so if, languages. So if you're interested in that, please uh, visit us uh, online. You can contact me through the contact form, or you can also uh, donate at reformedforum.org slash donate. It's a big mouthful, but thanks, brothers, for joining me today and, uh, and sharing this information with everybody. And we want to thank you for, for watching and listening, and we hope everyone joins us again next time on Christ the Center.